Good morning. Uh, our <clears throat> Sunday school lesson for today uh, is based on Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 18 through 28. Uh, three members of my high school graduating class became ministers. All three of them surprised me with their decisions to enter the ministry because one I, I figured would become an engineer. Another I had pegged as a, a doctor or a medical research scientist. And the third one I assume would probably become a coach because of his passion for sports. Each of them entered their service with very different approaches and perspectives. One now, an Episcopal minister, reflects a cerebral, matter-of-fact kind of base and delivers sermons that reveal dedicated biblical research. And he seems to thrive on formality and scholarly insight and adherence to tradition. Another became uh, a Baptist minister, but he found out he couldn't agree to some of the denomination stances on the roles of women, interracial marriage, and other social issues. So, <clears throat> so he became a pastor of an independent church. The athlete has been able to transfer his enthusiasm for sports into his work with young people. He served for a long time as a youth counselor and developed some dynamic programs in several churches. But now he has accepted a position as a minister in a, in a very rapidly growing progressive church. All three of these ministers use very diverse approaches but each one's made an impact. Uh, I think today's lesson will allow us to see how diversity is applied to the two central figures that we'll study today. Let me read the scripture for us. <clears throat> Beginning with the 18th verse of the seventh chapter of, of Luke. John's disciples told him about all these things and calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away or stumble, on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Now, what did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces, but what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. <clears throat> John was a very passionate and fervent messenger. He was eccentric, 
and somewhat dogmatic in his denunciation of sin and his call for repentance. He gained attention and a degree of notoriety with his brash rhetoric, and his prophecy of the coming Messiah was a welcome hope for his followers. They wanted someone to sweep away their repression and bring about an overthrow of their oppressors. Some of those followers were zealots who were ready to join a military uprising. Others were simply looking for the ability to worship freely and to elevate themselves above the living conditions in their present state. John's criticism of Herod for his involvement with his brother's wife led to John's arrest. And during his imprisonment, John sent two of his disciples to find Jesus. He wanted them to ask Jesus if he were really the one who was coming or if they should look for someone else. It could be that John's frustration had mounted as he awaited revolutionary actions. Or it could be that his disciples had questioned him and he therefore sent them to see for themselves that something far greater and far different than they had ever envisioned was taking place. Because the Gospels only include snippets of John's relationship with Jesus, we may often try to fill in the gaps for ourselves, which could be a mistake. What we must see is that their lives did touch, and Jesus respected the role of John in serving God's will for his life. Luke recorded that that when Mary confided to Elizabeth, John's mother, that she had been chosen to bear the Christ child, John, as a fetus, had leapt in his mother's womb. Matthew reveals that when John baptized Jesus, John had told him the role should be reversed and that it should be Jesus who was baptizing him. The Gospel of John also indicates that the Spirit of God had identified Jesus to the baptizer at the baptism. These had not been cousins who had grown up together. John had lived in isolation in the desert. Their knowledge of one another probably came from their independent conversations with their mothers. But their ministries as adults had somewhat overlapped. And some of Jesus' disciples had come from their original association with John. But now it seems that John is wondering why there's not already been a, a real powerful transformation of the world. But perhaps John is merely looking for an affirmation of what he believed to be true and for his opportunity to give his personal followers a chance to see for themselves. Notice that Jesus didn't seem challenged or offended by their question. <laughs> well, let's, let's face it, folks. We all have an eccentric cousin somewhere, a cousin that goads us into action or questions why we're doing what we're doing. Remember Cousin Eddie in Christmas Vacation? He may have had a heart of gold, but we sometimes wonder about his timing or lack of tact you know had Jesus been living in South Carolina he probably looked at the men that John sent and would have said well bless his heart well but let's look at how Jesus responded he healed many diseases illnesses and evil spirits and he gave sight to blind people these actions are the same ones that are spelled out by the prophecies recorded in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 35, uh, verses 5 and 6, and, and I think Isaiah 61, 1. So Jesus was identifying himself with prophecy, a prophecy that John and his followers would have been familiar with. He then added a statement at the end that said, happy is anyone who doesn't stumble along the way because of me. Perhaps 
Jesus is saying people shouldn't stumble over the difference of, in their previous interpretations of what a Messiah should be with what that true Messiah really is. Those, possibly including John, who had envisioned a, a militaristic revolutionary needed to understand that God's plan for salvation would come through actions of caring and love. It would be a philosophical revolution that eventually led to the demise of Rome. It wouldn't be just the result of a military coup. Jesus could have said, I'm the one you're looking for. But he demonstrated the message instead. When John's messengers left, Jesus spoke to those around him about John and asked them what had drawn them to the wilderness to see John in the first place. He knew that natural scenery wasn't the reason, and he was very certain that it wasn't an attempt to gain insight on fashion. Instead, they went to find a prophet, but more than a prophet, for John had been destined, destined to point the way toward him. He then re reaffirmed that he thought that there was no man on earth that could be compared to John and that his efforts were worthy. He wanted the people to acknowledge the role that John had played in their lives and wanted his life and work respected. If Jesus had merely answered the question that had been posed to him, doubts would have lingered. Instead, he showed the people that God lived within him. John's men returned with a knowledge of what they had seen that witness and their testimony could reassure John that he had not been mistaken and that his purpose had been and was continuing to be fulfilled. Now, here we are, the beginning of 2021. Most of us are, are still uncertain and apprehensive about the virus threat that surrounds us. Some have lost friends and even family members. If you've spent the year I have hibernating and venturing beyond my driveway only to carry off the trash or pick up grocery orders delivered to the trunk of the car or to maintain doctor appointments, your degree of frustration probably meets mine. I've seen far too many TV shows. You know, I, I never realized that Hallmark had enough Christmas movies a person could watch for months without seeing a rerun. Or maybe they were reruns and I've just seen so many of them. I've seen too many very bleak news programs. Yesterday was horrific. And I've been constantly reminded of the horrible divisions that are occurring in our country and around the world. I'm sure that some people throughout this year have wondered where God has been while all of this was taking place. Have you ever noticed that people find it easy to blame God or doubt God when the bottom drops out? Instead, these are times we need to reaffirm His presence in our lives. Well, how can we do that? Maybe we need to look at the way Jesus answered His questioners Remember last week when we talked about works of mercy? That's exactly what Jesus did to reveal his relationship to God. And that's what we can do now. We can find a way to help others and allow the light of God's love to shine through the darkness. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for providing hope and offering the peace that comes with devotion to you. Help us find opportunities to extend your love and keep us from causing others to stumble along our way. Amen.